Welcome to Schools Out. I'm Lisa Watson. We're continuing our strategic sessions on how and why Christian conservatives must elevate school choice from issue advocacy into a full-fledged social movement. Remember, social movements are the primary tool the left used to shift the culture and then shift the politics towards big government and away from our founding principles throughout the 20th century. While conservatives have been relying on good old fashioned issue advocacy, the left was mastering the art of building social movements. Pay attention here. While Christian conservatives were giving boring lectures on any given subject, the left was writing books, dominating the music industry, reshaping culture through TV and movies, building out nonprofits, and maximizing the power of personal testimony. All these moves were designed to capture the imagination of future generations. So, if conservatives want to win this war, issue advocacy is where we start but a social movement is where we gotta end up. Check out these historical examples. Number one, in the 19 teens, women's voting rights was the issue. The left took that issue and elevated it into the feminist movement. And guess what? The feminist movement transformed the culture. Another example, in the 1930s, improved working conditions was the issue. The left took that issue and elevated it into the labor movement. And guess what? Union organizing transformed the way America does business. Another example, in the 1950s, defeating segregation was the issue. Charismatic political actors elevated it into the civil rights movement. And here's a super duper powerful example. In the middle 20th century, access to birth control and abortion was the issue. Using the techniques I'm trying to teach Christians, the left elevated birth control and abortion into the pro-choice movement. The movement is so powerful that it can make or break a nomination to the Supreme Court. Affirmative action, critical race theory, diversity, equity, and inclusion, and Black Lives Matter all spring from the successes of movements that came before them. Again, there's good news. The model is out there. Better news? History proves that social movements are a winning formula. I have no doubt that school choice has the power Christians need to disrupt the long-term goals to transform America into a one-size-fits-all socialist nation. But we gotta remember the basics. Social movements are like a recipe. I've identified seven ingredients that we need to boost us from boring issue advocacy into powerful social media status. One, charismatic leadership, which starts to build number two, powerful messaging, which will attract number three, a few independent funding sources, which leads to number four, an infrastructure network, which will leverage number five the power of personal testimony, which will build number six, an activist class, which will secure the grand prize, number seven, favorable legislation. If Christians want to win these culture wars, we have to build social movements. And in the 21st century, if we want to build social movements, we have to do it on social media. Today, it's possible for a handful of social media influencers 
to have the broadcasting reach of a hundred million dollar media empire. Today, I'm gonna chat with someone who through the power of her personal testimony became an accidental social media influencer and now an accidental school choice activist. Let's get into it. Today, I'm totally geeked to be with fellow school choice activists and a great personal friend. Welcome to the show, Melissa Tate. Thank you for having me, Lisa. Okay, Melissa. As I said, we're personal friends, and we had a very interesting introduction where I met you on the street at a protest rally, Mm -hmm. and then right afterwards, I met you at a political rally that's when we knew this was a God thing and we started hanging out. Yep. So I know your story, but take a few minutes and introduce yourself and tell us a little bit how you came to become this activist. Okay. So my name is Melissa Tate. I'm a legal immigrant from Zimbabwe. I came to the United States at the age of 19. And basically I came over here with $300 and a suitcase full of clothes. I started my own business and uh, within about a year or so, I was doing about seven figures in revenue. Um, And then after that, I just basically was a mom. And and then when when we met, I had just started getting into politics. And it was just at a time when I started kind of looking at things, looking at the different things that were going on in the country. And I started gravitating towards the things that were happening as far as with critical race theory and all of that. I got on Twitter and that's, I think that's what really activated me into politics is when I got on Twitter, because that's where you actually see things happening in lifetime. And I was kind of more on the Ted Cruz side when, when things were happening in 2015. And that's kind of how I got in there. And then before you know it, my Twitter account just started getting bigger and bigger just by me just speaking my mind. And then I started getting invited to events. I think Candace Owens invited me to the first event in Washington, D.C. And that's just kind of how I accidentally became an activist. And just seeing what was happening in the country is really what activated me. So that's... Yeah, there was one theme that seemed to really jump out, that you really seemed to gravitate towards. And that was when critical race theory started, you know, permeating through the culture. And it was something about that that you recognized and it was turning you off. And it actually even led you to to write a book. Yes. So I'm going to get right into the controversy. Yes. Okay. <laughs> so um, when I saw your book, the first thing that jumped out at me was this title, where you have white privilege, Mm -hmm. then you cross out the word white and you replace it with the word choice. And your subtitle is what's race got to do with it? An intellectual, biblical, and experiential rebuttal to critical race theory. So what is it about critical race theory that was turning you off and, and made you write a book about it? Well, it was actually at the height of what was happening after the George Floyd incident, I mean, the George Floyd tragedy and the ensuing riots and everything that was happening and just seeing the way, particularly Christians and people that I knew in my family, family members, friends, the way they were reacting to it and the way they just jumped on the whole BLM, the Black Lives Matter movement. And I know that as a Marxist movement, as somebody who pays attention to politics, I knew that this was a Marxist movement, but a lot of people didn't know. And it it really shocked me because even like um, pastors and ministries that I've followed for many years, you know, they just jumped on this bandwagon with the with the critical race theory and the BLM movement. So I just thought, you know what, I really need to write a book that educates particularly Christians and conservatives on what is at the root of this issue when it comes to BLM and critical race theory. So the title of the book is White Privilege. I cross out where it says white and I put in the words choice because basically what I was taught is that it's not the color of your skin that determines your destiny or the quality of your life, but it is actually the choices that you make. And that is what I was taught. And that has been my experience. 
coming to the United States with literally nothing and, um, you know, working for a large company and going to school, working for a large company, starting my own business, being successful in this country, being black has never been a part of that. You know, it has never been an impediment to that. It's just me making the right choices. And that's been my experience. So I wanted to put that in there as well to push back on this idea that in America, if you're black, you're somehow at a disadvantage. Well, this is the part where I get bummed because we don't have the hours and hours that we have while we're <laughs> talking on the phone. And so me coming out of the left, mm -hmm. I basically fell for everything that you are rebutting, you're mm -hmm. refuting. I was um, the affirmative action officer for the ACLU. I was the co-founder of the Racial Justice Task Force. Mm -hmm. So coming out of those roles, it's really, really important to me, for me to, as a part of this repentance and atonement, for me to really drill down on why this is wrong, why this is taking the Black community in the wrong direction. And from day one, when I started talking to you mm -hmm. <clears throat> about school choice, I had told you I was getting so much pushback from Christian conservatives. Mm. It was a little demoralizing. But you just started having light bulb moments right away. And I think it was because how you are just, you just can drill down into the, the Marxism that's behind it. Yes. So when you told me you were writing this book, we had so many conversations. There was one in particular. So then you give me your book. I read a chapter of the book and you literally write the conversation that we had <laughs> in your book. So it's chapter 10. It's the top solution, school choice. Mm -hmm. And we had a conversation where I gave you this little cultural reference and I actually got the reference from God and he helped me to frame what I was trying to explain about why school choice is the only movement that can reverse what the left has done. Yes. So the, the reference is um, about Lucy, Lucille Ball, a TV show from the 50s. Mm -hmm. And it's the most popular episode of the Lucille Ball show. And it's with the Lucy and the Chocolate Factory. Yes. And I made a parallel with the government schools and how they are a conveyor belt. And they have 50 million chocolates mm -hmm. on the conveyor belt. And you... I could just see your eyes lighting up like, yes, yeah, yeah, I get it. <laughs> so what was it about that that just gave you the, the the revelation? Well, it was the visual, the visual of a conveyor belt. And you actually said that it's Lucy and uh, Ethel represent the Republicans or Republicans, conservatives and Christians. The conveyor belt is the systems that the left has. So you're having Lucy and um, Ethel sitting there trying to catch each chocolate and wrap it while the conveyor belt is flying past and they can't keep up with wrapping all those chocolates. So just that visual of seeing Christians and conservatives trying to grab these chocolates off this conveyor belt while it moves so fast, just made it make so much sense. Like we are never going to catch up with the left as long as they control the education system, as long as we're dropping off our kids five days a week, six hours a day, for 12 years and letting them educate our children, we're never going to catch up with, with the left as far as their indoctrination of the next generation. And that's where I, I, felt, I felt like that is the main issue that we as conservatives actually could have control over. Because, you know, when it comes to family, you know, you can't really have control over that. With education, it's something that we could actually switch on quickly. You know, family, it's going to take some time to really change cultural right, the right. things that happen in culture. But as far as education is, get your kids out of that system. You know, you don't need to have your kids in the public school system. So it's something that we could switch on quickly as okay. conservatives. Right. So... Let me drill down also into this value of Christian education, because mm -hmm. it's it's not something that I had and it is something that you had. So when we met and we were figuring out like this God thing that we were having, the sisterhood, it really was like how we are compliments because 
we look alike. Um, <laughs> you know, we're both black <laughs> women in America, but I look at you sometimes and I the things that you say and the, the way you frame things, it's genuine. It's real. You talk about... Um, you know, how you became successful. You talk about faith. You take, talk about family. You talk about education. Like, it's a formula. Mm -hmm. And you really always lean on a biblical worldview mm -hmm. where if you're stuck on something, you're like, well, the Bible says this. Mm -hmm. And so I'm going to do what the Bible says to do. And it reminded me of conversations that I grew up around mm -hmm. with my grandmother, my great aunts, my older family members, of the African immigrants are bringing what we used to have. Mm -hmm. So can you talk a little bit about that um, and specifically the biblical education that you received and why it's so important for your children? Well, actually, um, a biblical worldview is what built Western civilization. It's what made us the freest, most prosperous civilization in the history of the world is the biblical worldview that um, Western civilization embraced. So growing up in Zimbabwe, um, you know, I went, the education system was a British education system. It's more classical, more traditional. So it's not really a Christian education per se, but it is, a, I mean, it does have Christian undertones to it. It has a Christian worldview. And that's the difference that I saw coming to the United States and seeing how the 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 education system here is definitely, you know, the Christianity has been stripped out of every area of that, of that education system. So I think what we need to do as Christians is to go back to a more traditional education system where the Lord is the center of everything, because that is what is going to restore the prosperity and the freedom that we've had in this nation. So that's kind of what I was thinking. Okay. So you seem to understand this concept again, where when I'm having some conversations with Christians, I get the pushback and I finally came up with a question out of desperation where I said, well, can you get a biblical worldview without biblical education. So what would your answer be to that? Well, I mean, some people end up finding the Lord and, and end up having that world. But even then, even when, like when you came to the Lord, it took you a while to unravel all the indoctrination that you right. had that was anti, because, you know, when you are in a public education, if the underlying tone of everything is anti-God, it's anti-family, it is Marxist, it is all those things. So it's going to take a long time to unravel, even if somebody does end up, you know, finding Christ in, you know, in later in their lives. So I think a biblical worldview being taught from an early age is going to shape that child's life. Because even just a simple thing like marriage, mm -hmm. right now when I speak, like, for example, to my nieces and nephews, or my nieces, basically, they're talking about, I don't think I'm ever going to get married. And I'm like, what? I was five years old and I was already picturing what my wedding dress is going to look like. You know, but it, it it's just a testament of the kind of education they're receiving to where there is no value in marriage. There is no value in having children. And I see it, too, like even with young people, like a lot of people who are, you know, in their late 20s and 30s, they don't have any children. Even my own cousins. I think I'm the only one of my cousins that has children, let alone four. <laughs> okay. So it's just a cultural thing that we're starting to see take place. And, and it, it, the root of it is within the education system. And of course, you know, it's in entertainment. It's also in social media and all of that. So everything is tainted with this thing. But if, if, if we correct the education, the education bit, then you are going to see a big change because even because the education is where they spend most of their time. And most parents are not really raising their children. You know, they see their chil children and maybe a couple of hours before they go to bed after they come back from school. So they're spending most of their time at school. That's where that's where it's shaping their ideas, shaping their 
worldview shaping the way they think. And, um, and that's where I think that we as Christians and as conservatives, we can actually make a difference is if we take back education, take back control of educating our children. Okay, so you set up the next segment perfectly. Mm -hmm. And the next segment is what I call School Choice in the News. Now I want to introduce a segment I call School Choice in the News. The purpose of this segment is to highlight a current event story that impacts the school choice movement. So this story really jumped out at me because it reminded me of your American Dream story. For people who may be listening to the show instead of watching the show, let me set up the clip. This is a clip of a mom born in India, living in America. She's testifying in front of Congress. Her name is Azra Nomani. She explains on the show how she was living her American dream until her life collided with critical race theory. Let's take a look. It is targeting South Asians, Muslims, and Arabs, along with many other people. So many people are now being impacted by a divisive ideology that is in our schools also. It replaces the old hierarchy of human value with a new hierarchy of human value. Neither is acceptable. And federal authorities, state and local authorities, are subjecting us to surveillance, harassment, and criminal prosecution when we, as parents, stand up to this new racism. Born in India and raised in West Virginia, I moved to Northern Virginia in 2008 because I thought that the state had now voted for President Obama and it was now progressive enough for a minority like myself. I moved there as a single mother with my son just five years old. And in Virginia, he grew up. In 2017, my son learned that he had gained admission to Thomas Jefferson High School for Science and Technology. It was the realization of the American dream for us. But then, on June 7th, 2020, we received an email from the white principal at the school. And she told us, the mostly Asian, mostly immigrant parents and students at the school, that we needed to check our privileges. She told us that we had to change admission to Thomas Jefferson High School because she wanted a different type of minority. So Melissa, what do you think about this clip? Well, it's just a testament of what is happening in this country. You know, Martin Luther King wanted a colorblind society, and now we have a society that is hyper-focused on race, and this is what the left has done. They have created race as something that is going to be, that is causing a lot of division within the country. And to really understand critical race theory, you need to understand Marxism. And mm -hmm. Marxism is about pitting one group against another. It's about creating an oppressed versus an oppressor class. So what, we, what you're seeing with race, because basically, I mean, with Marxism in the United States, it really couldn't work like pitting people against each other poor versus rich, because they're, you know, most people in the United States, you know, do well for themselves. I mean, we do have poor, but it's not like there's not a huge disparity. So they needed something that they could pit one group against another. And race happens to be an issue. And obviously looking at the history of America, um, of slavery within the nation, it was a perfect thing that they could exploit to divide people. So what you're seeing with this issue of critical race theory is division. It's it's cultural Marxism, basically, to overthrow America and overthrow Western civilization, because we're seeing it, we're seeing it all over the West. So it is something that is used to justify redistribution of wealth. It is something that is used to justify overthrowing the systems that have been put in place in the United States that are, you know, capitalistic, that are pro freedom, and all of that. And it is used to dismantle all of that as a, as a reason because the oppressed class is then used, weaponized, and used to overthrow all of these systems that have helped build this country, that, have, that are the found, founding principles of this nation. Yeah, and it seems like one of the things that people never ask is what are they planning to replace the systems with? 
So if we Marxism. get rid of the church, what do we replace it with? When we get rid of the family, what do we replace it mm -hmm. with? When we get rid of free market institutions, what do we replace replace it well, with? Well, I think we've kind of seen what they're planning on replacing it with in the last three years. You know, as far as family goes, we see that, you know, the introduction of transgenderism. Now there's not even a man and a woman. So you just wonder, like, how this next generation is going to even understand the concept of marriage when there's not even a man, a definitive, <laughs> <laughs> definitive genders of male and female. Just the basic concept of that is under attack. So it it's just incredible to watch what's happening, honestly. So if you're a Christian parent, you're listening to this show. For some reason, you're still on the fence about um, whether or not you should pull your children out of the government school system and, you know, find a good quality Christian school. Um, if that mom was in front of you, what would you say to her? I would say that getting your kid, getting your kid out of the public school system is doing them something for their soul. You're saving their soul. And there's not any amount of money in the world that is worth your child's soul because before, you know, we were dealing with undertones of atheism, you know, things like that. But now we're dealing with things like transgenderism and LGBT extremism that is being taught to children. And just leaving your child in that system that is teaching them those kinds of things is really going to shape their future. And we're seeing an increase in suicide, anxiety, and all of these things that, you know, didn't exist before because we're teaching a whole generation things that are the antithesis of what, you know, we grew up with mm -hmm. or what, uh, you, like you were saying, your grandparents were teaching the formulas for success. Like you were saying, faith, family, hard work, you know, um, things like that, you know, and those are the things that, um, have created good lives for people and that it is a formula that works no matter where you are. And um, we're seeing that that is under attack. Well, let me circle back to uh, a thing you touched on as far as like um, social media and how you sort of came to prominence. Um, I, I'm spending a lot of my time trying to explain how the left was successful, the mechanisms that they used. Mm -hmm. I drilled down primarily on trying to give um, conservatives an understanding of the difference between social movements mm -hmm. and issue advocacy. Yeah. So if we grow the issue of social, I'm sorry, of school choice into a full-fledged social movement, mm -hmm. that's when we're going to get the power to reverse what's been done. And one of the ingredients, I refer to a social movement like a, a recipe, one of the ingredients has got to be your messaging, um, media, and you are one of the, on the front lines of social media, the mm. new frontier on how we're going to get information out there. What role do you see social media playing in us, you know, messaging and winning the information game? Well, I think social media is really where it's at. And um, I think that when we, I mean, you, you've you seen how the left has harnessed social media, particularly with TikTok. And right now, a lot of people, uh, I mean, a lot of the things that are happening on social media happen within a few minutes, mm -hmm. a few seconds. So I think what we can do with social media is create short clips mm -hmm. because most people really have a short attention span right now because of social media. <laughs> social media has created short attention spans. So even though, you know, long format things like we're doing now with podcasts is good, but taking short clips, posting them on social media and they go viral, that's, that's the way we can use social media is by, you know, creating short clips and uh, using it that way. So do you see us getting any traction? Are we winning? What, what's the temperature on uh, social media as far as the school choice movement goes? Um, you know what? I haven't really seen that much as far as social media. I think we're kind of running behind on that one. 
as far as uh, school choice, but other things I've seen that they have really taken off. So that means there is hope for, for school choice within that space. But as far as um, school choice goes, I think there is a lot of room for improvement on social media. Okay, that's why we need people like you. <laughs> so let me get into a final question. So sure. since we're friends, I want to keep it real. Mm -hmm. We are both black women and being black in America and taking positions that go against the mainstream narrative comes with some risk. Mm -hmm. um, why do you think that school choice and Christian education is the answer to reversing the left march towards cultural Marxism? Well, obviously, getting our kids out of that system, like we mentioned earlier, getting the, our kids off that conveyor belt and getting them into a parallel system of Christian education is going to change the worldview of these the next generation. And if we continue to keep them on the conveyor belt of the left, it's going to yield a different result. So basically what we need to do is to move them from that conveyor belt into our own conveyor belt. And I think the Catholics had the right idea because they, they've always created a, a, a school system. And I feel like that's where we as Protestants, Christians have dropped the ball is not having a, a, a school system. Because when you look at it, um, you know, people want a good education. And even if you're not a Christian, if it's a good education, a lot of people would put their kids in that school. And it's a form of evangelism because mm -hmm. you create a place where people can bring their children. And then at the same time, they're also getting a biblical worldview. Exactly. And you can also, um, you know, teach them about the Lord, teach them about Jesus Christ and all of that. So that is definitely something that I feel like we have dropped the ball on as, as far as Christians go. Uh, I know you talk a lot about education and how, you know, every church should have a school. <laughs> I like to do the numbers. I like to do the yes. numbers. You know, when yes. I see a number of 99,000 government schools versus 330,000 churches that literally sit empty 90% of the 90 time. 90% of the time. I know we have we have all the tools that we need. It's just do we have the courage to to build this parallel model? So, well, I think the we're at a good place now where people are willing to listen. I know you had said that you had gotten a lot of pushback from Christians and conservatives, but I think now a lot of people are willing to listen. Well, COVID <laughs> blew that up. Yes, it did. COVID was a blessing. So, so yeah, so I think that is something, it is a movement that ha that is still at its infancy, but it has, it has a lot of potential. So that's the good, the good news to all of it. Well, Melissa, I hate to have to start wrapping this up. I thank you so much for joining us today. And I know a lot of people are going to want to get this book. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people are going to want to follow you. So can you tell them how they would get the book and how they would follow you on social media? Okay. Uh, so you can go to my website, realmelissatate.com. Or you can actually get the book on Amazon. So that's easier to do. And then I'm also on social media at the right Melissa, the right as in right, not wrong, <laughs> Melissa, uh, on Twitter and on Facebook and Instagram. Okay, mm -hmm. perfect. Yeah. So that's it for this week. We hope you've enjoyed the show. Please like, share, and subscribe on whatever platform you're listening to this show on so that you don't miss an episode of Schools Out.